Join me for Focus on Tourism as we look into the benefits, challenges and concerns on tourism. Here we meet today is Mr. Samuel Obeng Apa, who is a tourism writer or you can say a content editor. would like to say a big thank you to our sponsors, CH Travel and Tour. With CH Travel and Tour, they offer services like flight ticketing, hotel booking, visa assistance, car rentals, steady abroad. You can contact them on 024-306-8558. 024-306-8558. Or you can contact them on their landline 030-231-8998. 030-231-8932. Also, would like to say thank you to Hansonic Hotel. Hansonic Hotel has the best accommodation, affordable, and easy place to be. Anytime you are in Dansuman looking for accommodation, Hansonic Hotel is the best place to be. They have nice restaurants that offer varieties of dishes. You can contact them on 030-230-0849. 030-230-0849. Today, we are here with him to discuss on the community engagement in tourism. We all know that community engagement means involving the local communities to get to know how decision makings are being made and all that. But can you also tell me the challenges that you would have to face in involving these local communities? Thank you. For having me on the show it's such a pleasure to be here challenges i think there are a lot of challenges you know first off we are talking about an industry which is very people-centered and if you know how human behaviors are anything that involves humans or people are bound to have challenges and so that in itself is a challenge but then specifically we are talking about strangers meeting strangers and when I say strangers meeting strangers, you as a tourist or as a visitor is a stranger exploring another strange land, right? And so ordinarily the people you are exploring or the people whose community you are trying to explore are a bit skeptical, they're a bit um, mindful, they're a bit overly cautious. That in itself is a challenge. Now, let me specifically mention the, uh, the bit about involving them. Here, we are talking about harnessing the voices of members of the communities as far as the development and the growth of the tourism is concerned. And we are talking about a country like Ghana, where our, most of our tourist attractions are really rural-based because they still exist in their naturally unexpected like unexplored state which means that you are going to like the local side of things you know what you you know in politics might say local government right so now how do you harness all these voices you know how do you tap into their resources their knowledge their technical know-how you know to make sure that whatever tourism activity or tourism enterprise you are running is, is, is viable or helps the industry to grow. And so it's very, very challenging. Because again, like I alluded to in the beginning, you are dealing with people. They have different concerns. They have different idiosyncrasies. They have different views. They have different opinions about everything, right? But then, you also want them to be part of it. And so that in itself is challenging. I mean, think of it as any kind of human endeavor where you need to bring on board ideas so that you have a common understanding to achieve like a common goal. Think of all the challenges that you can think of. And yes, it also applies within the tourism industry. That's actually very true, especially when you are involving people that mostly do not have an idea of what you are about to set up. So the decision making processes become tough in a way. But can you also tell me how, how tourism industry involve and collaborates with local residents in the decision making process? I mean, we are talking Ghana. So for Ghana, we haven't seen that much because the ownership of the tourist attractions and the site, we are yet still to get to know who owns what. 
it might surprise you to know that most of the tourist attractions you have here in Ghana, contrary to popular opinion that they might belong to the government, for which reason when there is an issue, the first you know, port of call is the government. It may even own, be owned by private people. There are some of these attractions that are owned by the community, others are owned by the traditional authorities, others are owned by the district assembly. And so it becomes very, very difficult to have a common ground when it comes to seeking opinions and ideas concerning how, for instance, the attraction or the site needs to be run. In Ghana, I'm, it's rather unfortunate. We haven't seen a lot of engagement until perhaps something happens. You know, and I can give you an example with the Kintampo waterfall issue. I mean, prior to that, we didn't, a lot of people didn't even know that there was such a fall. And if, even if they knew, the state in which it was wasn't too great. People were not going there. Then all of a sudden, there is an accident. Then government is compelled to now try and engage the community, traditional authorities, the assembly, on how do we you know, prevent an accident and so they go to upgrade the facility and all of those things. So it makes it very difficult because the ownership is very dicey, you know, and I can tell you for a fact that there are a lot of these sites and attractions now that are even not even licensed. They are not even licensed. And so in Ghana, we haven't seen that much. But for the past, say, four or five years, we see every now and then you have authorities from, say, the Ghana Tourism Authority engaging community leaders, chiefs, traditional authorities and locals, you know, where you have the attractions. And it starts with, okay, we want to upgrade a facility. We want to site, for instance, um, usually they are building washrooms, they are building receptive centers, you know, all of these things. And that you might say is a bit of you know trying to engage them but that's in itself is not because they usually go with a preconceived idea of what they are going to do so it's like we just come we, we think this tourist attraction needs a receptive facility and that's what we are going to do whether the people think that's what we need i'm not so sure they engage them that much. Unfortunately, we haven't seen much of it here. In I think that's the, because I, I wanted to also ask when you made mention of the King Tampo Falls, because um, not engaging the government in knowing that we have a tourist site here makes me understand why the government actually finds it a little bit difficult in engaging with the communities. Because I feel this um, waterfalls could actually bring a lot of tourists into the country. So doing this also in a way affects the government. I can now understand. But can you also tell me if there are any initiatives or programs that uh, promotes the participation of these local communities and tourism development? I think for the locals, right, how do you get locals to participate in the tourism activity? Mind you, tourism is a big business. There are several dimensions to the idea of tourism or the concept or the phenomenon called tourism. There is the social aspect, there is the economic aspect, there is the cultural aspect. There are different dimensions to it. I'll give you an example. How do you then involve the locals? Because really, like I indicated earlier, here in Ghana, most of our tourist attractions are within the rural settings. And so the idea that, okay, the attraction is there, somebody is just going to run it, all the money is then you know, repatriated back to the central government or the tourism authority somewhere now becomes problematic because now it needs to benefit the community. And unfortunately, so far, we've not seen a lot of encouragement, you know, even by those who are in power when it comes to tourism to, you know, sort of propel community interest in the activities. Elsewhere, I mean, we've moved around a bit. And I'll give you an example in Tanzania. I visited a place where we climb a mountain, Uzungwa Mountain. And before you are climbing, they give you a staff, you know, and they tell you this staff is made by the community members. And in fact, you find the person who made the staff is to help you climb, right? 
but you are paying 200 or 500 Tanzanian shillings for it. That way, you've empowered whoever made the staff economically. After you are done climbing the mountain and we come down, you have another group selling us this hot drink, ginger hot drink, with what we call, you know, Gangkati cake or something. And you are buying, you see, and the money goes directly to whoever is selling it. But Ghana, we don't even have that thing. I was at Afajato and I was telling them, I mean, people come and they want to climb. Give them something, you know. These are the little, little things you engage the community. Even if you think, okay, overall, the rates that are coming or that the tourists are going to pay are going to go to the central government. At least, how does the local person who sees the attraction every day benefit? It's a simple thing. A staff, you paint it, make it a bit colorful. The person sells it to somebody. That's how you get community engaged. Okay, we want to build a, a receptive facility. How do you think we should go about it? It's not like central government or tourism authority bringing up designs from Accra or Kumasi and just saying, oh, we want to locate this thing here. Ask the people, what do you think works? What kind of material do you think we should use? What kind of design? They may not understand it formally, but trust me, they have ideas. They know what would work. It's about finding the voices of those who matter. And here, when, when you talk about those who matter, we are talking about the community members. Whether you like it or not, they own the facility, right? You go to Afajato, and someone told me, I, I climb Afajato like five times daily. There's someone who does this thing daily. Now, what makes you think that if you bring somebody who is thought to have gone to some school and understand tour guiding or site guiding, this person will do better than the person who climbs Afajato five times daily? Do you get it? These are little, little things. You need, yeah, you want, okay, you need somebody who has a formal education. What stops you from? you know, engaging this person because obviously they understand, you know, the nature of the attraction. They, it's, for them, it's like, uh, you know, the first time I, I tried climbing up for Jato, you know, I, I, I ran out of breath and everything. And the, my guy was like, ah, but this thing, I, I do it like eight times, <laughs> you know. And this is someone who came from the community and for him, it was seamless. Do you get it? Yeah. So I'm thinking, and on that, you know, on that very day, I, I learned a lot, like a life lesson I could not. We had guys with us who would say, oh, this is our breath. But the guy who had been doing this thing eight times was so very patient, understood that, well, there's not everybody who can do this every day. Gives you words of encouragement allows you to relax, to catch your breath, then you can go on. These are little, little things that you can get from bringing somebody from Accra just because the person is going to some tourism school and stuff like that. So there are several ways you can engage. would like to say a big thank you to our sponsors, CH Travel and Tour. With CH Travel and Tour, they offer services like flight ticketing, hotel booking, visa assistance, car rentals, study abroad. You can contact them on 024-306-8558. 024-306-8558. Or you can contact them on their landline 030 231 030-231-8932. Also would like to say thank you to Hansonic Hotel. Hansonic Hotel has the best accommodation, affordable and easy place to be. Anytime you are in Dansuman looking for accommodation, Hansonic Hotel is the best place to be. They have nice restaurants that offer varieties of dishes. You can contact them on 030-230 0849 030-230-0849 but once again i also do want to know the steps that are taken to ensure that tourism benefits are distributed equally among community members i think it's what we've said so far is not too far-fetched you know because we are looking at a country which is very rural based you know ghana is not in fact most of African countries are not city-states, like you find in places like Dubai or Singapore, 
you know, those places where you travel the length and breadth of Dubai and just city, city, city. Here you have more of rural areas, right? And so you know that trying to make meaning, even to the larger economy, it means that it is first benefiting the rural folks. It's a simple logic. If you want to understand how beneficial tourism is to our economy as a country, then you want to first measure it by how does it affect the ordinary rural dweller, the so-called villager, right? Because you choose to go to Vili Waterfalls or Kintampo, or you, you choose to go to even Kweu, all those places are rural. So how does it benefit them? Okay, and that's where perhaps sometimes, look at Kweu Paragliding Festival. I mean, prior to it becoming an official festival that is on our tourism calendar, it was just Kweu people going back home, having party, having sit downs. Well, did it bring a bit of economic benefit? Yeah, maybe, you know, because when people, once people gather around and they are buying their food and drinks and stuff like that, there is some sort of economic benefit. But now, when government decides that, now, how do we expand this into becoming an attraction, a tourism product, a tourism offering? Can you imagine how much they make within that three three days when the paragliding is happening. Forget about what government is taking. I mean, government would take money for the paragliding itself. But now even now, you have businesses from Accra that are even going to set up there. And they make so much money. We are talking about pubs, night clubs for the locals. So I, I knew of someone who said, I, you have no idea how much I, I, like I got from just selling popcorn. Really? Just popcorn for three days. You understand and so if you understand tourism in that way then you begin to appreciate how beneficial yeah. it is to the local economy except that here in Ghana we've not so much given attention to some of these things and so you know we just have scores you know of such things happening but not very deliberate not very intentional because if you look at our festivals as well you know, whether you, you travel to a Kapim for Ujra or if you go to Kumase for Akwesidaya or you go to uh, the fire festival in the northern region, it's still some sort of an activity that's supposed to benefit the individuals, right? And so, yeah, in that regard, you say it helps, but because nationally we are not deliberate about, you know, harnessing some of these things, it still makes it very important to quantify. You know, because even for us as a country, how do we determine our tourism numbers? For instance, for international numbers, it is based on what we call arrivals. The idea that someone came through the airport. Yeah. Whether the person came because of tourism, we don't know. We say arrivals. And that's not scientific enough, right? It's not scientific enough. The fact that somebody came from the U.S. does not mean the person is a tourist because there are categories. We have travelers, we have excursionists, we have visitors, we have everything, right? But we say, oh, our tourism arrivals, you know, we, because we just the arrivals. It makes it very difficult. Looking at the arrivals that you're talking about, I know for countries like Mauritius, they do have different types of uh, permits that they give. They give the tourists, they give the business, and then they give the students. So are you saying that we should actually also start implementing these things to help us quantify the number of people that come into the country as tourists? So statistics is very important. You know, um, you can't really make any meaningful progress or any meaningful plans or decisions without statistics, right? So based on what are you, do you want to implement this? Based on what do you want to expand this tourism facility or something? And so if it is missing, it becomes very difficult. Ghana is not up to that level yet, you know, where we want to segregate. Say, I'm just saying, I know it's on TV, but I'll say, people get fed up with Ghana as a destination. When it comes to what we call repeat tourism, it's close to zero. Somebody who's come, who's been to the country to experience, what do we 
like to promote most the castle, the slave castle, our slave heritage and stuff like that. Somebody who's come to experience it once wouldn't want to come again because there is nothing exciting. At best, the only thing that can guarantee that they'll come again or even tell people to come, maybe our culture, our food, sometimes people just like our people, you know, but the, the real ones that we concentrate our minds on it's not worth coming to see again. If I've been to the Cape Coast Castle or the Almina Castle or whatever, why would I want to go there again to do what? There is nothing exciting. So in terms of categorization, it makes it very difficult. But then again, there is a modality of knowing the statistics, knowing the numbers. So the UNWTO, which has now become UN Tourism, has the, what we call the Tourism Satellite Account which has been developed years ago that it becomes the modality for getting your tourism numbers right. Ghana subscribed to it, but unfortunately we've not been able to implement it. I think since like 2005 or 2015, I've forgotten. But countries that are doing well, and you can check, they're all using the, what we call the tourism TSA, tourism satellite account, because it gives you the breakdown. So when somebody arrives, you know, through the provisions or the metrics that are captured under the TSA, you know that this person is coming as a student, this person is coming for business, this person is coming as a tourist, even the type of tourist. Is he, is he a backpacker? Is he an uh, adventurist? Is, you know, the TSA encapsulates all of these things. Because Ghana, we've not ruled out or we've not ruled the TSA out, it's still very difficult. You know, and that's why I'm saying perhaps we are not there yet. The TSA is perhaps the only thing that is that will give you the empirical numbers, you know, something scientific you can work with. Unfortunately, we've not ruled it out, so it, it makes it very difficult. But there are countries that are using it, and that's why Kenya, early in January, you see them release their tourism numbers because it is easier. They just key in the numbers into the TSA and so it is very easy to do it. But Ghana, we wait for a while. As it's now, we are in February and we don't know our numbers for last year. So, you know, so how do you plan? Exactly, how do we plan? <laughs> it makes it very difficult, especially when you talked about the um, repeat tourism. It becomes very difficult because I've noticed that the only time people do come to Ghana is mainly for what they call, quote unquote, dirty December. That's mostly... When did that come about? It came just about, what, from 2019 when we launched the Year of Return. See, there is no evidence to suggest that we can even maintain the momentum. If you look at the numbers for this year, it wasn't as great. Though this year... We had a record number of events that were endorsed by the Beyond the Return Secretary. I think well over 200, I think 208 or so. Yes, if you look at the corresponding numbers, because people became jaded with the event, they realized that ah, it's the same event, and I mean, which was compounded by other factors, you know, cost of accommodation, the rate of the events are uh, charging and stuff like that. And especially for, I mean, I'm talking about last December, it didn't even also help that we had this whole singathon happening, right? It gave people options. You know, people who would have loved to go and see, say, Sarkodi or Stomba or whatever. I, was, I, I read someone say, hey, I was going to pay 600 to see Sarkodi. He came to singathon. Why should he? <laughs> Do you get it? People had that mentality. You know, so last I was, I, I, honestly, as we say, I'll be very surprised if the numbers come and they'll tell we did better because from all indications last year wasn't too great you know it just to show you that keeping up that so-called dirty december i mean we call it december in gh momentum is not an easy thing you just don't assume that okay december people will come do you get it when you, you don't plan you don't know the numbers i'll give you an example now, December in GH has become a tourism product that we sell. Yet, during December in GH, apart from engagement with, say, the event vendors, the organizers, security people, there is no instructions concerning how it's supposed to be. 
right? So is it just because it's December and there is that party atmosphere? Do you have an event in like a, a, a typical residential environment throughout the night when people are sleeping? What are the rules concerning that, right? I'll give you an example. Rwanda doesn't have December in GH or December in Rwanda. Yet, they had rules, right? They had rules. See, they had rules that, okay, within this December period, I'll give you specific things. So from Monday to Thursday, you cannot have an event and the event will go beyond 2 a.m. I'm telling you. And even once it is an outdoor event, you need to be mindful of the noise levels. I'm telling you, they don't have December in Kigali or December in Rwanda. Even them, they had rules, right? They say, okay, from Friday to Sunday, you can have your event all throughout the night. But you need to be mindful of certain things. You don't sell a call to someone who is less than 18 years. In fact, you don't admit someone who is less than 18 years to the event. You don't, you make sure that your noise levels do not exceed certain decibels, you know. You don't, you know, and they tell you, and they, after that, they tell you that if you flout all these rules, we'll deal with you. But what does Ghana do? It's December in GH. Everybody should come. There is, there is an infestation of people. <laughs> so much noise, so much traffic, unnecessarily. You are in your room, you want to sleep, and people are making noise, and we, you can't complain because it is December in GH. Do you understand? These are the downsides. Elsewhere, it's, it's a big deal. I know perhaps it's a conversation will come back to us. We'd like to say a big thank you to our sponsors, CH Travel and Tour. With CH Travel and Tour, they offer services like flight ticketing, hotel booking, visa assistance, car rentals, study abroad. You can contact them on 024-306-8558. 024-306-8558. Or you can contact them on their landline, 030-231-8932. 231-8932. Also would like to say thank you to Hansonic Hotel. Hansonic Hotel has the best accommodation, affordable and easy place to be. Anytime you are in Dansuman looking for accommodation, Hansonic Hotel is the best place to be. They have nice restaurants that offer varieties of dishes. You can contact them on 030-230-0849. 030-230-0849. Thank you so much, Mr. Samuel Obingapa. We really do appreciate it. I've gotten to understand that really engaging these uh, people in the local communities also help to improve these tourist sites that we do have in Ghana. We would like to say thank you to our CEO, Mr. Ato Brakwa. Thank you once again to our number one sponsor, Hansonic Hotel. To sponsor us on this program, you can contact us on 050-912-3404. I repeat, 050-912-3404. Thank you to the CH Media team. Thank you once again for also watching us today on Focus on Tourism. Tune in for another episode next week. Stay tuned for more.